Hello everyone, my name is Civ Extraordinaire, and welcome to my definitive Civ 6 tier list uh, for, well, Civ 6, ranking all of the 50 plus now, I think, leaders. Wow, that is a lot of leaders, and my throat is going to be killing me. Um, I did a ton of uh, leaders, I think, with improvements. Well, I did improvements. Not There's not nearly as many improvements as there are leaders, but I ranked improvements um, a while back, and that killed my throat, and that was only like 25 improvements, so uh, Lord knows how many um, times my throat is going to be waking me up late at night um, because I chose to foolishly do a very long Civ 6 <laughs> tier list video. Anyhow, I've kind of been stalling. Let's just get right into it. I ranked these guys beforehand because I thought um, doing so would avoid just wasting time and uh, fidgeting around with the individual rankings. I also added uh, tiers between uh, the individual letters. I modified this tier list just a bit. You can see they're purple because I didn't take the time to add indiv individual colors, but I think that um, at least symbolizes they're kind of borderline. They could be B, they could be C as with the plus, um, but I thought it'd be um, just adding a bit more nuance. And also I got rid of the above average thing because people did not like that. Um, so whatever. Um, anyhow, let's just get straight into the uh, tier list ranking. I should probably start from top to um, bottom to top and get into some of the more juicier picks. I didn't rank too many leaders down um, below past C plus because I believe a lot of the leaders at least like 90% of the leaders in the game are at least um, playable or have some very good bonuses um, that make them interesting and consistent. And as the game has gone on, Civ 6 that is, uh, the bonuses and abilities have gotten more and more interesting, especially after the recent patch. So uh, let me just break down the tier list and start with Gandhi for the D tier. Um, he's down here, I think it's kind of self-explanatory. We have the step well for him. Um, that's kind of his main um, gripe is that for him, the populations are just very, very um, underutilized, and especially with specialists, it's just, they're not very powerful, and India is just a case of um, too little, um, too early, I guess, because he comes in super early, but none of these bonuses really work well together, and if they do work well together, it's just very underwhelming. Um, he themes around population, food, and amenities, and um, he's just kind of low, uh, just because India's bonuses are so crappy, and his bonus by itself is kind of underwhelming um, and only synergizes slightly with uh, India and even then you kind of want uh, a religion which he doesn't really have too many bonuses towards um, at least you need something to do with that uh, extra faith because faith if you don't have a great profit can be a bit hindering um, and that's kind of why Chandragupta is ranked a bit lower though I'll get onto him later uh, next we have Georgia ranked uh, fairly low similarly for a few of the same reasons because uh, Georgia did get a buff with the most recent patch. Unfortunately, India nor uh, the Cree, two civs who desperately needed a buff, uh, did not receive buffs in this patch. I guess Scotland also could have received a buff, but they did uh, get a buff, I think, a few patches back, so it wasn't too significant anyway. But um, we have Georgia. They got 50% faith, I think, from combat kills. Kind of similar to Gorgo and her culture, I think. But it really um, contrasts against her kit because she's kind of defensive, and she likes to get city-states, and by declaring war and killing other enemy units, I mean, I'm assuming you're not going to have barbarian farming camps uh, up and running 24-7. By going ahead and killing other units, um, you have to go to war to actually kill some of the city-state units, and you're not always guaranteed to get your city-states out of um, get city -states out of wars all the time. So you kind of have to be careful when you're getting into wars with city-states, and um, the CK is good when you can use it correctly, but it's kind of dependent on golden ages and you can't always time those. So Georgia, if you could time their bonuses, they'd be a lot better, but it's just a case of there's way too many things going on all at once. And the toolkit is just kind of all over the place. Um, and the devs tried to buff them last patch to just kind of odd how it kind of functions with the rest of their toolkits. Um, but I think a lot of the other buffs were good. Um, speaking of which, Eleanor did get a buff and I think France got a little bit of changes towards their chateau. But Eleanor, specifically, Eleanor of England, uh, she received a change regarding, I think, just how culture victories worked very indirectly. And now um, she gets some bonuses towards culture victories, since I think they also provide tourism through alliances or something like that. I'm not too sure on the specifics of that, but she gets tourism. Um, and everyone else, they just get tourism much easier. So I think she benefits a bit from that. That's why I moved her up uh, from like D or D plus to C tier. And uh, she synergizes slightly, uh, not as good uh, as French Eleanor with the uh, Royal Dockyard and kind of pushing out units. Uh, so 
just my opinion on that. Also, I noticed, is Victoria even on this tier list? Did I forget to put her somewhere? I think this tier list left out Victoria. I was just looking over it, and I did not see Victoria anywhere, because I was thinking of England. And I did not see Victoria anywhere. So, that's kind of odd. I guess I just put her at B or B plus tier anyway, uh, just to get that get that out of the way. But as I, I was, as I was going over that, I did not see Victoria. So, if you guys can see her anywhere, um, I did not see her at all, which is very, very odd. Anyhow, maybe she's somewhere hiding in the darkness below. But anyhow, um, let's go on to French, um, Black Catherine. And I think I ranked her fairly low, Black Queen Catherine, um, because she's just... She's kind of bland. She was a vanilla sieve. She gets extra diplo visibility, and it's a, another case of too little, too late, in that she gets spies at like castles, which is okay by itself, but you're not going to be using any of those bonuses until the medieval era. So you're not getting any of that kicking in until mid to late game, which can be very punishing since you're a vanilla sieve like early on. And other sieves get their bonuses like super, super early, like the Maya and their observatories. So that's kind of why I rank her um, down below. I mean, her later bonuses are good, but it takes a little bit of time to get them up and running, and that can leave her exposed. And even if her when her she gets her bonuses, I think like French Eleanor and um, her other counterpart, Magnificence Catherine. Uh, do their job just a bit better. Speaking of Magnificence, Catherine, she is an amazing leader, one of my favorite leaders. Um, she's B tier, but I'll probably just get her done with her right now since I'm, she's just like one click away. So uh, she gets additional culture for adjacent improved luxury resources from the Chateau. Love that because theater squares gain a new purpose. You don't need to necessarily theme them well next to Wonders. You can place them next to Chateaus and really buff them with extra culture. Um, and then you can also place them next to luxury resources and then you get gain additional um, culture and tourism through her interesting project. I think I think it's called the Theater Square Festival or the Ball Festival, whatever, and it grants extra tourism um, equal to luxuries, which is great because it adds a purpose towards accumulating luxuries, which is very very nice. And I think she's also one of the better AIs. But really love Magnificence Catherine, love her design, love everything about her, and one of my favorite surprises when uh, they announce the personas. So next is Dido. Dido is a bit of a controversial uh, pick, I think. Maybe not for C plus here, but um, at least when people are ranking her, because depending on the start, she can be a bit iffy. Um, if it's a coastal heavy map, obviously she's going to be much higher. But if it's something like Pangea, she's going to be a bit lower because she loves coasts and she loves going for those naval domination victories because she gets some insane um, healing bonuses thanks to the Koton. Uh, Koton, I think that's how it's pronounced, but. She gets some insane bonuses from uh, the healing, and then she also gains additional settler production. She goes super, super heavy on settlers uh, by the classical era, and she can get like three pumped out um, at like three separate cities, um, good cities, to pump those uh, early settlers out like very, very easily and quickly uh, colonize the map. Unfortunately, after that, she doesn't really have too much motivation um, to keep on settling because um, after that, I mean, right after she builds all of her colonies and conquers all that land, um, she doesn't have any further bonuses to really capitalize on, unfortunately. So, yeah, you have a bonus towards the government plaza, but if she got some extra science or something from, like, the Kothans or a bonus to trade routes for her new developing cities, that would be great to kind of continue on with continue on with the theme of uh, growing cities. So, C-plus tier, she's very good at early colonization, but beyond that, she's not very good at, like, tor getting, going towards a specific victory aside from, like, domination. And after she gets her biremes, after they're kind of outranked, uh, she has a bit more trouble conquering, um, and she's more of a good um, defensive naval si naval civ in my experience. I kind of talked about French Eleanor. Uh, she just does her job a bit better than uh, English Eleanor because I think she teams better with cultural victories, and I think that's really all there is to it. There were some recent changes to Chateaus, which I guess is another excuse for why I ranked her a bit higher, but she is pretty um, pretty good at what she does. Though, I wouldn't put her any higher than, like, B tier. C plus is kind of a medium between uh, B and C, but I think she does her job well. Um, same with Congo. He's very, uh, or Mvemba Atanzinga Afonso the first, I believe, as he was baptized. Uh, they went with his African pre-baptism name. Not that I have a problem with that. But, yeah, he has, also, he has a religion. He's... For whatever reason, he's specified a religion, even though he can't found one, uh, which is weird. Anyway, 
I guess that's just for what if scenarios. But um, the Congo are, or the Congolese, they are interesting because they love jungles and they can kind of build around that for uh, a tourism victory sieve, which is very, very weird since jungles are not necessarily the best towards national parks. It'd be interesting if he could ignore appeal from jungles, but I think we're kind of done with Civ 6 in terms of updates, so I'm not going to keep my wish list too um, big at the moment. But they nerfed his uh, great writer points. I think they took it out even. Um, but he's very good at getting early relics. I was tempted to put him on B tier, but um, I don't know. They kind of gave him a bit of a nerf with a recent update. I think they nerfed his great writer generation, and I think that was a bit punishing. I don't know if they balanced him anywhere else, but the Ingalan Beba is a very good uh, part of his toolkit. It's very good at early rushes, and ironically, the domination part of his kit is probably the best part. Um, since the Ngao and Beba, they cost very little iron, I think. Um, 10 iron is the normal cost for units, so if you are low on iron, they are great, and you can get them up and running very quickly, and they're great at exploring and defending your early uh, territory. Great with helping for that. So, yeah, he's good at accumulating relics. He's probably be a bit higher if I was considering secret societies on this tier list. I'm not considering any game modes in this tier list. I probably should have mentioned that earlier on, but um, he's good at defending and uh, kind of turtling, I guess. Uh, with his relics though they can be a bit hard to get and you have to get them later on so that's another factor just to why i'm con kind of considering he's a bit weak a bit weaker um of a civ leader though he could be b, b tier i guess um robert the bruce i guess he could also be b tier um he's leading scotland he has bonuses towards amenities and i'm probably gonna have to type in civ sec he's a fairly popular leader but um yeah, he's a bonus to uh, bonuses to amenities. His War of Liberation is not that useful. I've like used it once or twice. It is not relevant at all. That's very unfortunate, and it kind of takes up his entire toolkit um, just for that stupid uh, rise and fall kind of era themed um, bonus. I don't know why they were doing that, but they loved to do that back in the day. So he's entirely relying on Scottish Enlightenment. And the golf golf course, the Highlander, is completely useless in my experience, just like his uh, Cassis Belly. And by itself, it's a good ability, but it kind of um, is being leaned on too much by Robert the Bruce's weak ability and the um, uselessness of the Highlander. The golf course is um, good for what it does with the ability. Um, by itself, it would be a pretty bland improvement, but um, it does help with his ability. But Scotland could use a little bit of a buff to kind of push them over the edge. Unfortunately, they are one of the weaker sciences, but I liked what they were doing. They just need their um, bonuses for Scottish Enlightenment, either buffed or changed Robert the Bruce's ability. Um, next, we have Yadaviga. Again, one of the other civs that would be higher if we were considering secret societies in, but then again, um, so many things can kind of change around with... Um, man, she died early. Wow. Childbearing hips, am I right? Anyhow, um, <laughs> that was probably a very prude comment. Anyway, though, um, she has her bonus towards relics. She loves culture bombing things. I guess she could be B tier um, because she's very good at... I think I'll actually move her up. I'm going to make a controversial decision here. I'm going to move her up just because her wing two SARS are very, very powerful at pushing people back. Uh, that's the, like a very specific bonus they have. But they're very good at pushing units back. And her relics and then the early wildcard policy slot is very useful and can help uh, for getting an early great profit due to the uh, plus two great profit point culture card um, that she kind of gets. I forget the specific name for it, but it is very useful for some early great profit points if you need them. And then she gets uh, additional culture, faith, and gold from relics, which is even more relevant, again, with uh, Secret Society, specifically the Void Singers. And she just, again, very, very potent uh, when you can, uh, or if you know what you're doing, um, and you can leverage her. So, uh, C plus tier. We have the Maya next. I'm actually doing a Let's Play. If you guys want to check that out, you can check it on my channel. Um, I think we're on episode two as of, my, as of or maybe episode three as I'm uploading the video here. But the Maya are fairly potent. They were definitely D tier when they were released just because um, they have some very strict requirements. Like, of course, you're never going to get that um, optimal tile right there um, with the city placement. I've had some very, very bad um, starts with them. I was even considering ranking them B plus tier after the patch. But after a few starts, like 10 plus starts where I started right on the coast, um, it's very clear, abundantly clear, that her start is still not uh, perfect by any means. It's probably still one of the most um, rickety starts in the game, so uh, that's why I'm ranking her so, so lowly. The observatory is the best part of their toolkit. They love all of that extra science, and it's very easy to get it. If she could get bonus science from, like, Mountains too, she would be um, definitely a solid B or B-plus tier, maybe even A tier. And then, of course, rationalism helps uh, even out those observatory buffs. 
Okay, next we have China, Kublai Khan. He's ranked lower than his Mongolian counterpart. I've always been a bit civ uh, finicky with Chinese Kublai, and I'll probably rank Qin Shi Huang while we're here. But uh, China Khan, I guess we can call him, or Kublai. I'm always kind of been confused about his name pronunciation. I think even the devs got it wrong. But uh, Mongolian, again, I don't speak that, so I can't really offer any uh, clarity or authority on the subject. So anyhow, he has the um, bonus for Gerege, and he gains additional uh, Eureka and Inspiration points upon establishing a trading post. And boosted by China's recent additions, um, he's incentivized to go for Wonders because they grant Eurekas, which uh, bumped Qin Shi Huang all the way up to A+, plus tier, even maybe even S tier, just because of his insane synergy with that. I think he's probably S tier. But um, I'll just leave him at A plus tier for now. I don't know if he's necessarily S tier. These guys are all S tier is like usually breaking the game. I think Qin Shi Huang is probably the strongest A plus tier Civ, uh, but he's just so so good because of his wonder spamming and his free builders that he gets. Um, but back to Gerege with uh, Qin Shi Huang, he's incentivized to build um, text with the um, get text with the wonders and kind of rush them and. He gets bonus gold uh, from the Great Wall, which is kind of ironic since it costs so much uh, IRL. But uh, it grants tons of gold, tons of culture, and kind of helps Kublai Khan go for a culture victory if he is not um, rushing for a science victory with his unique uh, Eureka buffs. So that's kind of my um, theming behind that. And then the Crouching Tiger, uh, I guess it's a middle-of-the-road unit. Probably synergizes well with the Great Wall, but again... Uh, I don't know how defensive you're going to have to be with Kublai Khan, since the AI in this game I have found to be um, fairly passive after the Ancient and Classical era. So let's get to Kree, and then we finished off the C plus uh, portion of the tier list, and then we have all these leaders to get up to here. Um, again, I find a lot of the leaders are very potent, and I don't really th see the need to rank them any um, bit below the C plus tier. Um, so I think we have yeah Kree the Pound Maker. I think I mentioned them earlier, but another one of those civs that did not receive. Why am I going to Twitter? Another one of those... Okay, I'm getting very angry. Oh, okay, here we go. But another one of those sieves that did not receive a buff during the latest April patch, the final patch for the New Frontier Pass, and they get additional trade routes early on. They can claim tiles super fast, and then the Maker Yabop is uh, very unique because it grants early production, it comes very early, and it grants gold. Um, but unfortunately, the food bonuses and some of the production bonuses come super late at, like, civil service, which is, like, in the modern era. Um, actually, that's in the medieval era. Um, conservation, that's the one I'm talking about, is in the modern era. So it comes super late, comes at the same time that national parks come, and the make you by then, you probably got all of your use out of it. Um, and they don't, I don't even think they provide tourism bonuses, which kind of sucks. Yeah, I'm not seeing any tourism bonuses unless this hasn't been listed, which it has. I've had some instances where... Um, bonuses have not been listed in the effects area, but I don't think they provide tourism. And if they do, that's great. But honestly, I haven't had too much um, out of the make a WAP since they kind of kick in a bit too late. Anyhow, uh, C plus tier is done, and let's move on to B tier. So for B tier, I've kind of already explained Catherine Magnificence, one of my favorite Civ leaders. I have Chandra Gupta. I kind of already alluded to him too, but uh, his early Varu rush is very very potent. Um, and India's abilities kind of just bring him down, but that early Varu rush is amazing for some early domination victories. Uh, we have Saladin for um, B tier 2. He's very good at synergizing with Faith. I think the Madrasa is also another amazing part of his toolkit, even better with uh, Secret Societies because it um, can funnel that Faith. Of course, we're not talking about it. Secret Societies really revolutionizes the game, so if you guys want, I'll maybe even make it another tier list. Um, if I'm still alive, if my throat allows me, if I haven't developed some horrific case of throat cancer by them. Um, anyhow, if you guys really want to see another tier list with, with secret societies and all the game modes factored in, I can try to do that, though it will be a bit chaotic, um, definitely. Um, anyhow, though, we have Saladin with the Madrasa, and it grants plus five science standards for the university, and then it grants faith uh, equal to um, science, which is very, very good. It'd be even better if this was a temporal replacement and it kind of had the um, opposite effect. I think that'd probably be too good for Arabia, but that early faith is very good since he is guaranteed a profit, and he can kind of rush that with the last profit ability since the AI has been prone to um, going for some early um, great profit rushes with like with Stonehenge. Though I've noticed the AI has built Stonehenge less, um, but the Mamluk is also good. It used to be amazing. Um, I think the health bonus was like even um, better than 
uh, it was like as of now. So um, it heals at the end of every turn though, which is great, great, great. And then it comes uh, super early at stirrups. So very, very good. And it's a heavy cavalry unit too on top of that. And heavy cavalry are almost always uh, pretty damn good in my experience. So next we have uh, Hadrad. No, I'm pronouncing that wrong. Harald Hardrada, or Ardrada. I'm not sure if the Norwegians pronounce the H or drop it. Um, but we have Harald Hardrada, and he has some very good rating bonuses. Um, he leads the Norse, or the Norwegians, actually. Um, and the Berserkers are good. I, okay, I guess. I think they had some changes. And then the Stave Church also gives production to the coast. And then Nar uh, is really good because he can enter the coast early and raid kind of um, without penalty, which grants extra science, faith, and culture and gold, which is very good. If he could steal relics on top of that, that would be even better to slot in his stave churches, but um, I think that'd kind of be op and piss a lot of people off. So anyway, next we have Trajan, um, just kind of my shower thoughts, but uh, Trajan, he can, I mean, the Vikings did steal a lot of relics, but anyhow, um, let me th stop thinking about my uh, Viking ideas. <laughs> anyhow, Trajan. Uh, we have Trajan's Column. He gains founded cities, um, or founded cities gain free buildings uh, in the city center, city, city shitter, yeah, um, city center. And he basically can set up super early for ver a lot of the be beginner players um, and kind of help them out there. He's a very good, probably the best beginner civ. Um, the bath also helps with managing amenities, and then he gets um, insta roads uh, to all of his settlements. So very, very good all around. I wouldn't put him any um, spot above like B. He's very good, um, definitely above average, but I don't th think he's particularly A plus or S just because he doesn't break the game and um, he's just extremely consistent, probably the most consistent leader in the game. You can have any start with him and he'll probably do good as long as it's not in the middle of the desert. Uh, even then, all you really need is a mountain or a um, river and you can use those baths to kind of uh, monopolize on that. So uh, next we have Teddy Roosevelt. I'll probably do both um, rankings since they are a bit a bit far apart so um and there's a reason for that because bull moose is just fucking broken i'll just be um completely honest with you so uh let's go with rough rider first and then bull moose is one of my other favorite leaders um so i've kind of changed my preferences around a bit but if you guys also want to see another top three favorite leaders my preferences have changed um so if you want to see that kind of video i can get to that um, but also, if you're enjoying the video so far, please leave a like and subscribe. I'm trying to hit 1,000 1, subscribers, 100,000. I almost said 100,000. Uh, that would be insane if I hit that by the end of the year. I don't think I'll get that. But if I could hit 1,000 subscribers by the end of the year, uh, that's kind of my goal. I don't know if that will be too realistic um, since we're already halfway through the year. But um, I'm trying to get there. So if you guys want to subscribe and like to help the video out, and if you're enjoying this, um, please let me know um, by subscribing and also hitting the notification bell. So, now we have uh, Rough Rider Teddy. My shilling is done. Um, goal accomplished for the um, video today. But anyhow, we have Rough Rider Teddy. Loving his design apparel with his choice of cap and headwear. Um, he gains plus five combat strength for all units in, inside America's home continent. That was his base game ability over here with uh, just base Teddy Roosevelt. And I don't know if you can still play him. I may be wrong. I don't think you can. But um, he gains envoys also. Uh, from city states and overall he's a pretty good leader very good at early domination uh, securing a foothold uh, and then kind of capitalizing on that with the film studio later on uh, and probably plopping down a few national parks um, and he's good at uh, corralling city states too so the rough rider i think is also good um, but overall a very solid b tier pick um, definitely above average I already talked about poland with Jadwiga. i moved her up and then next we have b tier with kublai khan so with our little pal over here, Kublai, or Kublai, um, I think I actually already mentioned him, um, though he is very good at early rushes with his cavalry, and I think he synergizes well since he can get um, trade routes very early on and um, just instantly establish trading posts thanks to his ability here. And yeah, just very good at getting things up early, though I think his dad or his grandfather actually, uh, Chinggis Khan, I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, he does a bit better job. I'll just get, get Chingus out of the way because uh, I think I ranked him A tier. He could probably be A plus tier um, if we're just being honest. Just because his ability stacks so, so well, plus three combat strength. It's just plain, simple, and to the point. Um, and then he can capture um, defeated cavalry units. And then the Mongolian ability on top of that with Ordu is kind of overkill. 
Um, honestly, you could just keep his leader ability and maybe his unique unit, and it should be fine. But the Keshig and everything with War 2 and all that, um, with trade routes and everything, and then the additional combat strength for Intel was just so, so good uh, on top of all of his cavalry buildings. Definitely A or A-plus tier for me. Um, I haven't played him in a while, but I always just, you always know, with sieves like that, where the abilities stack, uh, and they're just very worded very plainly and clearly, um, it's just a case of too good to be true, and indeed, it is very good. Um, so, Genghis, again, B, A plus tier, and then his son, Kublai Khan, B plus, very good um, synergy with the Eurekas and Inspirations, and then the Keshig and Ordu on top of that uh, supplement his kit very well. Next, we have Gitarja, and I think she's fairly straightforward. She's had a few changes since her release in October of 2018 with the Kume and Indonesia pack. She get, uh, grants yields or has bonuses from the coast and lake tiles, which provide um, 0.5 adjacency bonuses. They used to apply, or, 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 they used to apply one plus one, a straight plus one bonus to um, specialty districts, which is very very good. Um, and then she also, apparently, I didn't even realize this was in the game, but entertainment complexes built adjacent to coast or lake tiles gain uh, an amenity. I didn't even know that was in the game, but apparently it is, um, which is interesting. Not too game-changing, but the Zhong, uh, fairly standard naval unit here. I think it gains bonuses for flanking, and not too um, out of the ordinary. Uh, we have the Kampung, though, which is probably the... Um, biggest part of her kit, it grants additional production, food, and housing, and then tourism helps keep it really relevant. This is what the Make a Wap really needs. Um, tourism from food, and you can just spam these things. Uh, not only do they look beautiful, um, but probably the best UI design in, my, in the game, in my, in my opinion, but um, they also provide tons of tourism. So, who wouldn't want to visit a uh, floating sea shack, am I right? Yeah, uh, amazing there. But uh, again, Indonesia, very, very potent sieve. Um, B plus tier, tier here. They could be A tier um, if you got a really amazing coastal start, but they can be uh, limited depending on some of their initial starting sea resources. Next, we have the Kume, and this is going to be, um, I guess, themed well since they are part of the same pack here. Um, unintentionally put them next to each other, but of course, that was uh, must have been part of my genius there. Um, so, my accidental, accidental genius. But anyhow, uh, they've received tons of changes since the most recent patch. They no longer receive buffs towards relics, which is unfortunate since it was fun to kind of uh, take that unique approach to faith and culture and have like one big faith culture victory uh, with your missionaries. But they have the Damre, which is replacing the Trebuchet now, and it is very, very good. It comes with military en engineering, and they are great for demolishing cities. Uh, we have the Prasat, which gives uh, Kume cities plus 0.5 culture for each uh, citizen. I think they also gain faith for each citizen. Um, and they also grant tourism uh, for each 10 population. So unfortunately, that doesn't stack with an indiv individual pop, like one tourism per one pop. But uh, that would be pretty uh, insane. Um, anyhow, very, very good sieve. Probably one of the few sieves good for going tall, like the Maya. And they just play tall really well to the T, uh, the very definition of tall. Uh, though you can go wide with them, it'd be even better um, depending on the rivers. Of course, their start bias can be a bit finicky, which is why I'm not putting them A or A plus tier. I've had several starts where I didn't get any rivers, and while mountains are good for aqueducts, um, I th I don't know. It's just very hard to kind of theme um, the aqueducts with the mountains uh, some of the time, and then again, you're not always guaranteed to get flat terrain. Uh, especially in your mountains where it can be hilly, and that's just kind of my complaint. Of course, the mountains are also already taking up a tile, unlike the river. So uh, mountain starts without rivers with the Kume can be a bit more rocky. Uh, no pun intend intended, of course. Um, but again, a bit iffy there. So that's why he's not higher. But anyhow, we have Suleiman for... Uh, he was also included in Civ 5, I think. But uh, we have Suleiman for Civ 6. He is in B plus tier. I have not played the Ottomans too, too much. I mentioned this in my last video. I think I played them once since I um, last played them just to see the Niter bonuses for the most recent patch. And I think that did improve their viability. I think I'd probably move them up from B to B plus tier. I'm not, I haven't checked my most recent list. Uh, but you guys can go check that video and compare them. Um, anyhow, I have... Uh, I think the Janissary and um, Ottomans, I think the Janissary is probably listed in my notes as being uh, one of the better sieves, um, or not sieves, one of the better parts of their toolkits. And then he also has uh, Grand Vizier, which grants um, him a unique governor, very, very fun to play around with. 
uh, even though militarists are not my favorite part um, of the Civ Six experience, of course, conquering can be a bit of a pain, and warfare is not too fun. Uh, so I'll have to see how that goes in Civ Seven. But he does get, uh, interestingly, a governor title with gunpowder, and he has uh, the unique governor Ibrahim, who has some bonuses themed around um, warfare, which is fun to play around with. And then he also has the Barbary Corsair. And then we have Canada, who is more of a controversial uh, leader here. So Wilfrid Laurier leads the Canadians, and he has bonuses, receives some more bonuses towards farms, and now he receives one more production, one more food towards mines and lumber mills, and I think farms and camps as well, and that just makes him much more viable, uh, plain and simple. I could probably move him up to A tier, though. The early Tundra start, just like the Mali, um, leaves him very exposed in the early game, which is kind of why I'm ranking him lower. The Hockey Kit also kicks in. Um, hockey Kit. The Hockey Rank... Rink, oh God, I'm, I'm butchering this. Um, the hockey rink, there we go, um, comes in a bit later, and unfortunately it comes in a bit too late in my opinion, but I still like the culture um, granted towards uh, the tundra. I think it also grants tourism, but I don't know if they've mentioned this. Yeah, it grants some tourism um, here, I'm pretty sure, and it also is very easy to theme with the tundra, of course, since you're not going to be improving the tundra too, too much. Um, aside from like your mines and then of course you're not going to be improving snow at all uh, unless there's like some hidden copper resource um, but anyhow very very good uh, for that early cult that not early culture that late culture and tourism and then the Mountie also received an additional charge but boost which is very very good for um, again theming with culture and tourism so aside from Canada's rough early start I think they'd be B plus maybe even A tier given the right circumstances um, moving on next, we have another super um, controversial sieve. It was recently reworked, um, and I think it's a lot more stable now, the Spanish. Um, my main gripe still with them is that they have no bonuses, at least early on, towards getting a great profit, which can gimp them because faith, again, is a very dependent uh, resource, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you don't have missionaries uh, and you don't have any thematic bonuses towards faith, you're going to have to wait around for a, situ a situational moment like getting uh, Golden Age dedications. Um, and then again, it's very hard to plan out your Golden Ages unless you're like Georgia. Um, and even then with the Georgians, it is still unpredictable. Um, so it's just, it can kind of be a bitch. Um, I'll just put it bluntly. Uh, to try to manage your faith. Aside from that, the Michion, um, it does have some faith bonuses, unfortunately. So if you don't get a great profit, you're kind of screwed. Um, it does have great bonuses towards science, and then it has great bonuses towards food. And he also has bonuses towards cities not settled on another continent, and he gets additional production towards them. And he also gets a builder when founded, which is very, very huge. Um, he could probably be A tier, uh, but I think B plus for now. Kind, kind of depends on his starting bonus uh, bonuses. I think he has a geothermal fissure start now. So that's very, very powerful. I could put him A tier. Um, I guess you could say I'd rank him A tier, but he's right. He's borderline, basically. Um, depending on the start, he could be A plus tier if he gets some really good geothermal fissures. Um, he could be C plus tier if he gets um, a shitty continent start and he gets no geothermal fissures um, or just one or two. So I think B plus tier is a fair place to put him in. And then again, of course, if he doesn't get a great profit, I could even put him as low as C tier. Um, and if he's landlocked, it really depends on the map he's in. So I think B plus is a fair place to put him. Um, B would be a bit too low, and I think A would be maybe just a bit too high. Um, but again, depends on his starting location. Vila and Mina, also another uh, starting location dependent Civ. And unfortunately, Civ, just Civ 6 at least, uh, has some problems with some of the more starting location dependent Civs um, as you add more um, dynamic Civs. So it's nice that they have more unique abilities with Civ 6 as opposed to Civ 5. But I think they could still iron out these starting locations before they move on to Civ 7. Um, but they have done that with the Maya and stuff, so I don't think it'd be too hard to do that to Spain and Portugal and uh, Vila Elmina, at least make the maps more dynamic. So anyway, speaking of Vila Elmina, she received a little minor buff uh, with Grot Rivieren um, and then Radio Oranje. I think Grot Rivieren actually stayed the same. It was Radio Oranje which received a buff, and my Dutch is terrible, so again, I apologize for any um, any mistakes there. But anyhow, Radio Oranje, it has a bonus to domestic trade routes providing plus two loyalty per turn for the starting city, and then trade routes sent to or um, received from a foreign civilization grant plus two culture to the Netherlands. Blah, Netherlands. Okay. Um, Netherlands or Nederlands in uh, Dutch. Anyhow, uh, the plus two culture can be useful, and then the plus two loyalty was also um, fairly useful in my latest playthrough with them. 
um, just for keeping some of those early civilizations and cities um, under your reign. Again, not that a powerful of ability, especially compared to some of the other leader bonuses, but Radio Oranje, um, a bit more potent with the latest update. Next, we have the Mali with their gold. I mentioned them earlier. Um, I don't think there's too much to say aside from the fact that they can be very good or very poor depending on the amount of desert they like to get. Um, I find that the best starts that work for them is getting like a desert edge so you can still receive some bonuses towards your capital city, um, but not too much desert to where uh, your city struggles to grow with like um, potentially a lack of hills or um, just getting swarmed with flat desert tiles. Uh, since you can't mine those and get your gold. But uh, he has a very unique uh, start where he has uh, minus one production for mines, but he gets plus four gold, so he really is a gold king. Uh, and he loves purchasing uh, out commercial hubs with faith and then um, just buying everything out since he's kind of incentivized to do that with the reduced production uh, towards buildings and units. So uh, very good sieve. I love the Suguba. Um, I haven't played them too, too much. I don't like gold heavy sieves, um, but when you play him, he is definitely a sieve to remember. Uh, next we have the, though he has a really weak start, I have to uh, concede that. He is a very weak um, starting sieve, probably one of the weakest next to Canada. But anyhow, uh, next we have the Persians. They were nerfed for whatever reason. I thought they were fine in the most recent patch, uh, but apparently the devs did not think that, uh, and they nerfed them accordingly. They, I think, nerfed, what is it? Um, I think they nerfed the Paridaiza, 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 and they reduce some of the appeal. It used to be plus two appeal, but I think now it's just plus one appeal and it still receives the flight bonus for tourism. Um, they don't really think they needed a nerf, but they did that. So Persia is very good at rushing um, early on and then kind of conquering cities like with uh, Bull Mo um, Rough Rider Teddy and then keeping them and then developing them with like Paridesa and uh, kind of just keeping them around and developing them um, to be cultural powerhouses. So not much to say about him, just very good at early rushing and then developing his cities. Next, speaking of early rushing, we have Gilgamesh who leads uh, Sumer or Sumeria, and he has some bonuses towards alliances. He also has a bonus to starting towards rivers, and the Ziggurat is also very fun to spam, um, but he did receive some changes, I think, recently um, in that they gave him some more bonuses towards early war, I think. Though, I think they also changed the ziggurat placement. I'm not too sure. I'll have to bring up the change um, notes. But um, I think they had some very minor changes in that. Um, capturing, yeah, capturing barbarian posts also grants uh, tribal villages rewards. And then he g gains um, bonuses towards uh, levying city-state units. I think the levying bonus is, um, what's the change? Yeah, uh, which is kind of weird. I think that's, ki that's kind of Matias's ability. But um, whatever. Uh, anyhow, he has the Ziggurat too, which is grant for which is granted, which is great for granting uh, early science and culture, and that's really all there is to say about him. His work heart is very, very good, and just an overall fun vanilla sieve to play around with. Uh, next, we have Nubia, who also kind of favors the desert. We've had some very desert um, heavy sieves towards uh, this part of the video, but Nubia did receive another change too, and um, they changed a lot of these sieves. I'll be saying that a lot, but um, they received a change, a nerf to um, their production, so they produce um, ranged units a bit less effectively. Now it used to be plus 50%, now it's 30%, and their Test City Archer is a bit weaker because of that um, indirectly, but they're still very good at early rushes, and then the Nubian Pyramid is great at terraforming. I put them hard, higher if they didn't start in the desert, but um, that's kind of the um, crappy hand that they were dealt, though the Nubian Pyramid is a bit better for dealing with those desert starts, so I'll have to give them that. Um, next we have the Aztecs. And the Aztecs are very, very good, very good, I might add, um, at capturing early uh, city-state units and civilization units, turning them into builders, and then rushing their own uh, units thanks to the Eagle Warrior. And then Montezuma is good at accumulating luxuries uh, and kind of capitalizing on that. Uh, the Eagle Warrior, very, very good uh, unit. It kind of makes the Aztecs, and that's why they're in the A tier in the first place, aside from uh, also having synergy with rushing uh, spaceport districts and, like, um, I think also later cultural um, theater squares if you want to capitalize on that after your uh, early wars. Um, very consistent sieve overall. We have the, have the Swedish, Swedish, not the Sweden, um, the Swedish next, and they have bonuses towards a unique uh, building for the government plaza called the Queen's Bibliothek. And the Queen's Bibliothek grants uh, early, uh, it comes at the medieval era, so super early um, for great people, and it grants great writers, great artists, great musicians. And then it has a ton of slots, and it automatically themes those, which is amazing. 
um, very, very good uh, at getting a consistent uh, early lead with great people, and then that factors into her Nobel Peace Prize bonuses. Um, overall, a very consistent and solid sieve. Funnily enough, she um, founds Protestantism, um, despite the fact that she was a practicing Catholic, which is interesting. Uh, I think she even fled Sweden for Rome. Uh, not a good leader pick, but uh, I think we can probably get onto that later um, <laughs> for a more controversial video. Not that this controversial, not that this video is already controversial enough, but um, maybe for another video. If, again, if you guys are interested in that, um, let me know in the comments. But uh, again, prioritizes great works, very good at uh, going for great works, and just um, she's A tier really because she knows um, what to do uh, with great works. So next we have Lotaro and the Mapuche. I recently tried him out in a stream. If you guys want to browse the channel for my playlist, my streams playlist, and check that out. But he leads the Mapuche, a very unorthodox choice, I thought, for the Rise and Fall expansion, but I still like their inclusion with the Kamamul. And he received changes to uh, governors. I think he also saps loyalty much faster. It used to be like 10 to 20, and I think it's now 20 to 40. Um, very good at revenge killing. Probably the only Civ that is good at um, revenge killing. Um, but again, the Kamamuls are also insane. Probably one of the best UIs in the game uh, alongside the... What is it? Um, not the Feitoria, the... Um, Indonesian improvement, the Kampung, uh, and it grants plus one production, did not need that, uh, that's probably to make it compensate for um, you not being able to build mines in your territory with them out, and then they also grant culture and tourism equal to 75% of the tiles appeal, I know it doesn't say that here, it says it over here in strategy, but it is, does not say that um, over here in effect, so it can be a bit deceptive, but the Kamamul, super, super powerful, um, Mapuche A tier, I think that's pretty self-explanatory, maybe A plus tier, but they are just insane they had a huge leap up um, with the recent changes i think they were probably arguably um, b or c plus tier but the extra production and bonuses towards governors and captured cities made them a definitive a or a plus tier uh, for me so next we have greece um i'll probably knock out gorgo and pericles with this but uh, we have greece next and they are themed around culture pretty self-explanatory gorgo loves to kill people uh, pericles does not like to kill people he likes to kill people for um uh, he does like to kill people, but only because um, they touch the city states. So, um, Gorgo uh, kills units for culture, and then that is equal to 50% of the cult combat strength. And then recently, she gained uh, a bonus with the April patch plus one combat strength for every active military policy card slot uh, in the current government. And I was under the uh, mis um, misinformed assumption that this was only for every filled military policy card slot, but in fact, this also applies for wild card policy slots. Um, which is pretty good. I could probably move her down to B plus tier. Um, I think Pericles is a bit better. Not that they're competing for the same spot. Um, but I mean, it can be a bit hard to kind of pivot after you pick um, her culture cards, like for a more passive playthrough with wild cards um, and fill those with like economic policy slots, uh, the wild card policies. Um, and then you get declared on immediately and you kind of have to spend your goal to switch back and pivot to um, filling those wild card policy slots with military uh, policy cards uh, and the fact that military policy cards in the first place aren't too useful can be a bit um, of a letdown but this made her very very relevant probably um, at the same level neck and neck with Pericles um, but Pericles is very good because he's very simple again kind of like um, not the Mapuche but um, I don't know uh, like Persia or uh, Gilgamesh. So he's very good at getting uh, culture, and then he can, he's not too good at getting tourism. He has to kind of build his Acropoli to capitalize on that, but um, very, very good at getting early culture, and he's just overall great at getting um, his Acropolises up early, up and running, and then the Hoplite kind of compliments him um, in the um, Acropolis as well. So uh, the additional wildcard policy doesn't hurt. And it kind of themes well with Gorgo, but again, both of these guys are great, and Greece in general is a great civilization. Too bad Basile does not lead them as well. Um, but I guess the they went, kind of went with the Byzantines, so a bit of a monolithic choice there. Anyhow, uh, we should probably get on to, who do we have next? Uh, Zhuwao. Interesting. He was the latest leader added. Uh, he leads the Portuguese, and he has two unique uh, buildings and districts. So actually two unique one, one building, one improvement with the Faitoria and the Navigation School. Very good with the early site bonus. Uh, very unique, plain and simple. Great at finding early um, city settlement locations. And then, of course, um, mapping the map. Um, good at discovering things. And 
his limit for trade routes is not too restrictive. The reason he's not like S tier is because um, it, depending on the map, kind of similar to um, Indonesia and I guess to a lesser extent some of the river based civs like the Kume civs, um, he's just kind of dependent finicky with that. He likes a very good um, coastal start and you don't always have that guaranteed to you. So that's kind of why he is A tier. Uh, we have Shaka. He also received bonuses towards, um, I don't want to go to Canva. I want to go to uh, Civ 6 Shaka. And he received bonuses with the Econda at Grant Science and Gold recently. Aside from that, I think I moved him up a bit. Um, but very solid A tier Civ uh, with the MP. He can build cores earlier thanks to the Econda. Um, and the MP are great for rushing uh, early on, just kind of uh, kicking people's ass. Uh, another African Civ, we had the Ethiopians. Overall, I think a lot of the African Civs are pretty good. Uh, they did some very good jobs designing, um, or a good job designing um, those Civs in general, I think. But uh, mainly the second, he leads Ethiopia, and his ability is Af actually the Civ ability is Axumite Legacy, and um, he grants additional faith from improved resources, and then uh, trade routes also grant some weak faith. And then um, archaeologists, archaeologists and um, archaeological museums, which is very powerful, can be purchased with faith. Um, and then the real power for the, for the um, kit here comes from the Rock Hewn Church, which grants faith from adjacent mountains and hills. And then, of course, the plus 15%, I think, boost um, towards culture and faith equal um, culture and science equal to faith uh, is very, very powerful. It gets them up to A tier. They just need that. Uh, and then he specialized towards hill with, hills with the additional combat strength, which is very, very good. Um, overall, a very solid leader. Uh, kind of my idea for the, um, I think a, he's like conceptualizes the paradigm for um, a good DLC or season pass leader. Uh, speaking of DLC and season pass leaders, we have Ambiorix with the goal. I know this is a bit controversial, kind of ranking him a bit lower. Uh, but in my experience, he can be a bit finicky with resources. Um, since we're not factoring in like Maui and Heroes and Legends, he'd be a bit higher if we were. Uh, since you can kind of place down bonus resources uh, like Copper with Maui. Um, but he grants um, culture kind of similar to uh, production costs like Gorgo for units. Um, though he doesn't benefit from killing them, he just benefits from uh, pumping them out outright. So a bit of a weaker culture exchange there, but it's still more consistent. You don't always have to kill and go to war uh, against people. So he also receives uh, bonuses for flanking, and then he gets a bonus for his OP Doom for being next to Iron um, and other mines and quarries. So very, very, very potent. Um, grant, grants culture, and I think he gets, gets a culture bomb. So um, he's a very good Civ, definitely above average, um, a very solid and maybe even an excellent uh, Civ pick. Uh, but they did a really good job with the goals with Ambiorix, and I think that caps off the A tier. Next, we're going back to Greece. We have Alexander and uh, Basile II. I'll probably just get these guys off one by one, um, or maybe um, a twofer. Um, but basically, Alexander gets bonuses from Conquering Wonders. I think he's always been a very good military civ. He gets two unique units that come in at the same time. Um, very good for an early conquering spree. Um, Basile also kind of has a similar focus towards early conquering, though he likes holy sites. He has a more of a religious focus. Uh, unlike Alexander, and the Tagma is great for a mid-game rush and kind of going for other civs after you build up your capital of Constantinople, making it the city of the world's desire, of course. Um, I still hate the Byzantines and their inclusion in Civ 6 um, for other reasons. I have my own video, uh, my top three least favorite civs leaders, if you want to watch that. But um, I just dislike his inclusion anyway, um, because they're overly military focused, kind of blunt there uh, with Byzant Byzantium. Um, but that's another topic for another video. Um, anyhow, we have another Dom leader. I noticed Dom leaders, at least in my rankings, uh, tend to be a bit higher. Um, not because I really haven't played them too much, but more so because Dom leaders, I think, in Civ 6 are hard to go wrong with. Um, they're just very good at early rushes most of the time, and they're great at um, just conquering cities with their unique units. Not really too hard to go um, through with. I think probably the harder part about domination leaders is just balancing them out and making them... Um, not too over the top, um, whereas that's kind of the opposite problem with cultural um, leaders in the Civ 6 and scientific leaders to a lesser extent, I think. Anyhow, we have another domination leader, though. We have Matyas, who leads the Hungarians, and I think I actually pronounced that correctly, um, but he leads the uh, Hungarians, the Raven King, uh, Matyas Korvinus, and he has bonuses towards um, science, I think, or production with the Great Thermal Bath, and then he also has uh, bonuses towards levying city-state units, and 
That's kind of his main shtick. And then, of course, the Black Army complements that. And I think he has another unique unit that themes around um, city-states and kind of alliances. But uh, anyhow, we have Qin Shi Huang. I also covered him, so I'll kind of skip past him. And then we have Pedro and Russia. I think another twofer because they also specialize in tundra and jungle, respectively. Um, they're very, very similar sieves. Um, I think they're probably designed at the same time, uh, just kind of covering tundra and jungle uh, biases. But um, they get bonuses from uh, adjacency, um, bonuses for campuses, commercial hubs, and holy sites. Don't want to chop those in theater square districts uh, from jungle, so obviously keep your jungle. Um, and then they give also um, plus one appeal. So uh, very, very good for jungles and kind of building national parks around them. Uh, Minas Gerais is kind of a hit or miss, depends on your naval map settings. And then the Street Carnival and Copacabana, I can also uh, see being a hit or miss. Um, the, the Theater Square projects for the um, commercial hubs is really where you're, or the entertainment complexes is really where you're going to go um, for them. Just because they're very good at gain, um, gaining great people. And then, of course, Pedro is great at uh, buying out great people for a discounted cost. Uh, I think Piotr is also similarly great at um, gaining great people. He received a buff, so he's kind of on the same level as Peter, I think, or Pedro. The main reason he was buff um, and broken in uh, Civ Six is just because of the Lavra. You got a ton of great people at the same time uh, with Grand Embassy and then uh, trade routes. Actually, those because of the, because of the Lavra. But the Grand Embassy is also great uh, for catching up to AI, especially on higher difficulties, and um, he's good at Tundra. All in all, these people like to focus towards um, great people, and they have their respective um, start biases. So probably the most two similar leaders in the game. Uh, that might be a controversial statement, but these guys are very similar, and they also like great people, and they love to um, just specialize. So um, actually, I take that back. They are probably um, a bit broader, but I mean, they have still some specializations like towards culture and science. So uh, next we have the Vietnamese, and then we have uh, I think we finished with Genghis, and then we're on to the, uh, the S tier, and then we should be done. Uh, my throat is going to kill me. Uh, it's already killing me, but I'll suffer through the pain just for you guys and uh, cap off the tier list here with uh, Vietnam. So Vietnam, I think, is more of a culture-dominated uh, civ, especially after the patch, but uh, they have an inter interesting and a very nice purple and uh, yellow color scheme with that little turtle. Very cute. Um, but the Chen is definitely the strongest part of their toolkit. They also have a very weird bonus towards uh, building districts solely on improved, uh, not improved, unimproved features like jungle, marsh, and forests. Uh, so they are kind of screwed over by deserts. You don't want to settle near them. Um, but definitely not too start dependent, unlike the Kume and the Indonesians. So um, definitely a very interesting Southeast Asian sieve with some Southeast Asian flavor. And the Chen is very unlike a, an encampment in that you are building them for culture and tourism uh, and not for great uh, generals, which were taken out uh, in the April patch. Kind of um, just further going to show that it's more of a um, city center and not an encampment. So Vietnam used to be great for early rushes uh, with their jungle bonuses because you get plus five combat strength for jungles uh, and they're like impossible to conquer. I think plus 10 combat strength if uh, you're in your own um city so your own borders but uh, again vietnam very very good um at pu pushing early on and uh, i guess now even better at culture and tours and victories or tours and victories by themselves there's no culture victory but i digress okay next in the tier list is the scythians and they are very simple again they are great at pumping out early units they got a buff with the recent patch buffing the kurgan it's even better now uh, it wasn't too good actually um but they pump out um, two for the price of one, quite literally. Um, I mentioned it earlier with Peter and Russia, kind of comparing them, but I mean, you literally get two units for the price of one. Um, so you're just basically cloning units here. Um, so, I mean, this is like the Zerg, Zerg rush, the Civ. Uh, get your stock of horse archers out, dominate someone. It's plain and simple. Um, not exactly the most exciting sieve past the early game, but they are very good for conquering people and uh, screwing their lives up. Next, we have um, the Babylonians, who are, au contraire, quite the um, different sieve here because they were introduced in the November patch. They were very controversial because of their um, very straightforward Eureka bonuses, um, which kind of opened themselves up to more uh, controversial uh, and very nuanced strategies where you could rush like rifling um, super early on. I even tried that on a stream. 
uh, but you can rush out uh, rifling. The Saboom Kipitum is great for scouting out tribal huts for uh, early Eurekas and Inspirations, which, of course, grant you that tech. Not Inspirations, unfortunately, but early Eurekas um, grant you the, granting you the tech. And then he also has bonuses to Envoys uh, when he builds his districts, which are great for um, getting city-states and then kind of further capitalizing on uh, some of his missing, uh, I guess, science and cultural uh, buffs. But um, very, very interesting and nuanced Civ. He could be like C tier if he got a really shitty start. But overall, I find that um, he's around A plus to S tier uh, usually. And his Palgum is also uh, very slept on just because it grants plus one food for um, adjacent freshwater tiles, which is just very, very good. Um, so, so good. I could probably spend an entire uh, video covering him. Not that I like his bonuses or uh, the leader portrait that much. But um, his just bonuses in general, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I, I don't like how the bonuses are designed, but the bonuses themselves are just super, super powerful. Um, speaking of super powerful bonuses, and for the rest of this video, um, I'll be covering super powerful bonuses, obviously, with the S tier um, rankings. But I think I already covered Bull Moose, um, but he's very good at his natural par national parks. He grant gets science and culture early on, just such a powerhouse. Um, but speaking of culture early on, we have Hojo Tokimune, and he gets some culture uh, thanks to his unique factory, kind of the worst part of his toolkit. Um, and then he also grants um, plus one adjacency bonus to uh, adjacent districts, which is great at SimCitying. Very simple and straightforward bonus. Um, and then I guess the Samurai and the Electronics factory are kind of the tacked on parts of his toolkit. All you need to know with him is with his Meiji Restoration ability, uh, districts are super, super powerful, and he is just able to beeline um, science and tours of victories. Uh, next, we have the Australians. Probably, I'd have to say, along with Babylon and maybe uh, the Maori and the Inca, the strongest civs in the game. I think maybe Germany would be the fifth strongest civ in the game, in my opinion. Um, I'd have to see if I rank them individually. But uh, John Curtin, such such a such a good uh, civ leader, even if he is a bit of a dick. Um, in terms of how, I, I, at least in my experiences and how he interacts with other players um, as the AI, but he get, grants tons of production. Um, if you hate him, he'll kill you, uh, basically, because he can get 100% production for 10 turns after you declare war on him. So if you want to screw him over and stop his insane snowballing, um, basically, his civil ability is, uh, fuck you, I'm just going to keep on moving. Uh, and Vibin, so uh, <laughs> he's just insane. He just can settle everywhere. He can terraform with the Outback Station. Uh, he gets bonuses based on appeal to all of his districts. I mean, he's just insane. And then the developers is a slap in the face to the community or whatever, at least to me. Uh, maybe they knew I hated uh, Australia. Um, they just said, screw you, Civ Extraordinaire. We're buffing him again. So uh, right on. Um, they buffed John Curtin, damn it, again, and they gave him an even better coastal buff, I think. Um, I think they increased it to like from uh, one to two for the coastal turret bias, which is kind of like insane. But um, whatever, uh, I see where you're coming at, devs. Um, I'll have to get my, my game back on. But um, apparently we didn't complain about Australia enough because uh, they're probably definitely either the number one or number two Civ um, in terms of rankings here. So not that I rank these guys. Um, like I didn't put Scythia here, meaning that she was number one, basically. Uh, these guys are just randomly um, slotted into each category. So uh, depending on where they are next to each other does not mean uh, whether they're number one or number two, obviously. So uh, maybe that was not so obvious, but I'm just going to clarify that now towards the end of the video. Probably should have mentioned that earlier, but uh, we have Coupe next. Uh, we're almost done. He is the fourth to last uh, leader we'll be covering today, and he grants, um, I think he has a very interesting, probably the most interesting start because he starts in the ocean and then he is granted uh, science and culture per turn before he settles his first city, and then that first city grants, or is granted, uh, or it gets uh, a builder, and then it gets uh, plus one population, uh, and then his palace on top of that gets uh, plus three housing and plus one amenity, so if you want to settle that on the coast immediately, uh, might as well, just to get that early builder, and then um, the housing and all that stuff, and then you can get like a few free text thanks to the science and the culture. So um, he also has some very powerful units in the uh, form of the Pa and then the Toa, uh, and the Toa can construct the Pa, and they also grant more health than the normal fort, so they're basically a unique improvement, um, even though they can, can kind of coexist side by side with the fort, uh, but I digress, not really a replacement. But anyhow, um, the Mara'e, the Mara'e, I 
don't speak Maori. So um, anyhow, I'll just pronounce it. The marae is great at um, some of that early cultural yields. Uh, he can't, I don't think he can, can uh, get great profits um, or um, a lot of not great profits. That's the Congo. He can't get, he can't get great raiders, but uh, he does get plus one tourism from flight. So he doesn't really have too much of a problem with uh, works. He can get tourism. Uh, either way from national parks he does that a bit better than teddy though i find that um his early starting bonuses usually aren't as potent as bull moose so coupe again such a good late naval leader and he's very unique and dynamic i don't play him too much just because some of these civs with more overpowering bonuses i don't find to be too fun since i mean once you're playing with them from the start you usually know by like turn 50 um whether or not you're gonna win as opposed to like other civs by like turn 150 knowing when uh, whether or not you're going to win. So I just like a little bit of nuance and at least towards the end of the game, still being on my toes, but that's just my personal preference. Okay, so for number three towards our last uh, Civ leader, we have the Inca. They used to be one of my favorite Civs, and then the devs kept kept buffing them for uh, who God knows why, um, but uh, they just kept buffing these damn people. <laughs> uh, I don't think they were even this good in the um, Civ 5 game, but... Uh, they just love the Inca, what can I say? Kind of like with Australia. So they gave the Terrace Farm plus 0.5 housing, and then they give the Kapakanan additional uh, buffs, I think, or additional production per mountain or something. It was something stupid. Uh, but they buffed the Terrace Farm by giving additional housing. The Terrace Farm already by itself is super, super potent. Uh, Pachacuti is why he's so good and why he jumped up so many tiers after uh, the preserve was added, basically, is because he can work mountains. Um, and then on top of that with the terrace farm, it just ensures that he can get some insane, uh, insane yields. I think I probably even mentioned that in the strategy. Look how long his page is. Um, they're definitely talking about the preserves here. So yeah, um, it's just insane how much, uh, yields he can get. It's just disgusting. Actually, one of the few disgusting civs in the game. Um, not that I hate the Inca. I love the Inca and the Kui, of course, uh, though they're not included in the Inca toolkit or in this game. Um, I just thought I'd mention that because I have guinea pigs, so um, I am also a Kui extraordinaire. Anyhow, <laughs> back to the topic at hand. Uh, the Inca, again, love them, uh, but I also hate them because they're just disgustingly broken. Uh, so, again, mountain tiles, they're just insane with reserves, and that's all I really need to say. Um, but Korea also, another sieve that was kind of like a fuck you buff, um, <laughs> right to my heart, because they did not need buffs to the Seowon, yet they did receive some buffs, I think, in the in the form of buffs to mines. So I think mines also received plus one science, and then maybe farms received plus one science additionally. So I think mines already received plus one science by default, but they buffed Korea somehow, um, just to spite me, I know. Uh, that's all you really need to know about Korea. They have the Seowon, and then, of course, for whatever reason, their civility is themed around uh, the civility three kingdoms is themed around buffing the sail one and uh Sonduk also loves um further buffing her cities god damn it uh, Fraxis. Uh, she loves further buffing her cities um with science and culture it's like every time i go back to korea i'm like Fraxis, why couldn't you just make korea interesting like at least with civ 5 i mean of course you were getting like jet planes by um the renaissance era but at least there was some fun you had along the way with sailed sail or sun dog not only do you have a shitty leader but you also have um very bland bonuses to go uh, along with that i mean I, I i guess i'll take that back i don't i don't really know too much about sundu but um all i know is that she's taking sejong's spot and um for that i'm just gonna have to uh spite her so uh finally my throat is rejoicing because um though i should probably get to bed soon it's like 11 and I should be studying for my finals tomorrow, but I'm still making this tier list for you guys. So again, my plea is, um, if you like the video, leave a like and subscribe. But um, we have Frederic uh, Barbarossa for uh, our last civ leader here. So Frederic, you are great at, um, again, being very, very simple. You'll notice all the S tier civs, um, almost all of them have very extremely um, complex bonuses like Australia and uh, Coupe and Bull Moose, or they have extremely simple bonuses like... Um, Scythia, uh, Germany, or Korea. So, yeah, um, it's either one or the other with these subs, no in between. Um, and of course, Germany is no exception. They get bonuses towards combat strength. Um, for city states, they love to kill city states, take them over. Um, I don't know why he's such a sick bastard, but he just loves torturing city states. Not that I don't love indulging in that, but they are just skipping the nuance here and going straight towards um, city state domination with Germany. Um, so, 
whatever, I guess. I guess he needs more room for um, Lebensraum uh, for the uh, districts. So, uh, whatever you do, you Germany, uh, I guess that's historically accurate, but um, not that I like it. Anyhow, his real powerhouse, I've really been just going on too much. You can tell I'm tired. Um, but he gets um, increased district uh, caps. I think it's plus one for um, kind of ignoring that initial population uh, so he can build more districts and cities, and that's really all that matters. And then his Hansa, uh, just look at the description for this. Jesus, yeah. Um, you can tell they went overboard because there's like three whole pages in the Civ Wiki uh, describing the versatility of the Hansa. Yeah, you can just make huge triangles with them, or ja, I guess, for my um, German puns there. You can make huge triangles easily with aqueducts, and then they get bonuses um, from bonus resources, another pun that I unintentionally um, said aloud, maybe unintentionally, who knows, um, but plus one production for um, bonus resources, and then it's just easier to theme with commercial hubs, so um, on top of that, industrial zones by themselves were easy to theme, um, the Hansa just makes it insanely easy, and they're great for going for science victories, because you can get like plus 20 Hanses easily, um, if you can just theme with aqueducts, uh, which require very um, lenient, they have very lenient uh, placement restrictions, and they're just a flat plus two, uh, which is really plus four if you think about the um, the cards there. So, um, very easy district to theme, themes incredibly well with um, Germany's uh, extra production and um, their district uh, slot. So, just a great district, and it really makes uh, Germany. But uh, if you like this tier list, I'm surprised I'm still alive by the end of this. Um, it's been like 40 minutes, I think. Anyhow, if you like this tier list, I'll leave a like and subscribe. My voice is shot. I'll never make another video again. Um, I'm just kidding. Maybe I'll come back tomorrow. But um, I always come back. Oh, well. <laughs> Anyhow, this has been Civ Extraordinaire. Uh, love you guys so much. Uh, but if you like the video, leave a like. Again, subscribe. I've said this like several times. Um, but this is my last plea. Please subscribe. Uh, if you like the video, and uh, if not, please leave me some feedback in the comments below. I know people will definitely be disagreeing with me and shitting on my opinion, um, but of course, my opinion is objective. You are always wrong, and I am always right, um, and that's all you need to know. <laughs> of course, I'm just kidding, but um, thank you guys again so much for watching. This has been so extraordinary, and I hope you have a guys have a great rest of the week. Uh, I'm going to go lie down and cry while my throat kills me, and um, I hope you guys are enjoying the video uh, and the content so far, but thank you guys again, and I'll see you later. All right. Peace.